Just let's talk about Woody. Okay. I don't know how much I need this. Um, actually, no, I do need this for the stream. Um, hello, people online, um, and hello, people in person. Um, I, it is my privilege to um, welcome you all to uh, the first uh, hybrid lecture series that Search Talk is hosting. So you are all currently in person for the first time at our newly appointed uh, Len Miller Lecture Theatre. Um, it was renovated last year. Um, unfortunately, um, we couldn't book it last year, but we booked it for this year. And uh, big thanks for the uh, Department of Surgery and Mr. Kumalo for letting us book this space and using it. And um, and then this all is being streamed online to YouTube. Um, there's a little camera feed there. And um, before this started, you were all being filmed by the lovely audience camera. Um, so yeah. Um, when Malcolm and I were discussing what we wanted to do this year, we wanted to take what we'd learned from uh, the pandemic and um, take what we used to do and kind of bring them together in some form of um, amalgamation of uh, surgical passion. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to um, give, hand it over to Sudarshan Pillay, our head of events, to open this event particularly and uh, get everything started. So I uh, hope you all enjoy. Cheers. <laughs> okay. uh, hi, everyone. It's great to see everyone here. Um, so yeah, welcome to our, one of our first official events for the year. Uh, and you know, Surgeons for Little Lives is quite important um, for Surge Sock. We've been quite involved with them in the past years. And I think recently we did an Easter egg drive as well and visited their ward at Barra uh, just last week. And it's been honestly a pleasure to work with them. Uh, honestly, we, we thought we would bring someone from Surgeons for Little Lives here. Uh, and so we have Dr. Naraf Patel. Uh, he is a consultant pediatric surgeon at Barra. And he's also the director for Surgeons for Little Lives. So yes, he's very important. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to just welcome him up uh, to, to start his presentation. Uh, just a, raw, a warm round of applause. So Sudarshan, there are many directors. <laughs> I'm just one of them. <laughs> but, but thank you, guys. Important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, guys, uh, for having me. Um, I wasn't uh, too, um, I didn't get such a detailed brief, so I hope that you guys enjoy, enjoy the talk that I'm going to give you. Feel free to ask as many questions as you like. You can ask questions in the middle, at the end, whenever you want. Yeah, it's not a very formal speech or anything like that. I have two prizes for you guys. So. Uh, I didn't put my phone number up there. I'm going to just tell you my phone number now, and one of you can write it down and circulate it. It's 073. Just one person can write it down and circulate it. You're part of the same society. 073-558-9173. So the first two people that WhatsApp me the correct answers get the prize, okay? Uh, you can just meet me at Barra, and I'll give it to you. So, so my name is Nirav. I'm a pediatric surgeon. I qualified here at WITS. I'm so happy that my name is up there on that board there. My primary motivation for getting my name on that board was that my cousin's name was on the board, and he couldn't be the only one that was on there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm one of the consultant uh, pediatric surgeons at Para, um, and I have the privilege of uh, also being one of the directors for the charity called Surgeons for Little Lives. I'm not sure how many of you guys have, uh, just by way of show of hands, how many of you have been to Barra? How many of you walked past Ward 32? You've seen our new building. How many of you were in the ward last week? How many of you have I taken for tats before? Nobody. Sure, surprising. OK, cool. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the charity is. We're going to go over some interesting cases. Uh, we have the quiz towards the end. And then you guys can ask me whatever questions you want. Uh, you know, the one that I would start with is why pediatric surgery. 
Okay, so Surgeons for Little Lives is a charity that was started in 2015. Um, it was actually started by the head of pediatric surgery. His name is Jerome Loveland, Professor Loveland, and a few of the other consultants in the unit, uh, namely Dr. Ellen Mapunda, who's the head of pediatric surgery here at CMAX, uh, Dr. Andrew Grieve, who's the head at uh, Nelson Mandela now, and another man called Chris Westcott Taylor, who used to be one of the consultants at Barra. So they were the core clinicians that started the charity, and they did it in conjunction with a whole bunch of people that are not doctors. And the primary motivation for starting the charity was to uh, uh, basically create a mechanism to get the resources that we needed to be able to deliver world-class pediatric surgical care in public facilities in Gauteng. So you all know that in the private sector in South Africa, we have first-class care. I mean, there's, you, you can't match that care anywhere. I can tell you from personal experience, I don't know if any of you have ever worked or traveled overseas, but I lived in Canada for six years, and I worked for MSF. Uh, I can tell you that the, the standard of medical care that you get here in the private sector is almost unparalleled. And we wanted to be able to bring that level of care to public facilities. So where, we, where we're lacking is not in the, um, in the human capital, so to speak, because all of the consultants and ultimately all of the registrars that work in the public sector all end up sort of in some kind of private practice, but there's a definite lack of resources. And so that was the initial intention for the charity, uh, to be able to get resources so that we could deliver this high level of care that we are capable of and that we deliver in the, public se in the private sector to patients in the public sector. Since then, the charities uh, really expanded quite uh, substantially. So now, not only do we um, uh, improve um, the level of care that we offer in the public sector, but we also do other things. So we contribute to the training of pediatric surgeons in South Africa. Anyone? This is not for a prize. How many qualified pediatric surgeons are there in South Africa? Just in case any of you are thinking of pediatric surgery as a career. So, so number one, it's actually very good that there's so many of you here because surgery is not a very popular profession. Um, how many of you, how many pediatric surgeons do you think there are in South Africa? Not enough. Yeah, yeah not enough, yeah. <laughs> there's about 70, yeah. There's about 70 qualified pediatric surgeons in the whole country, right? Yeah. It's way better than neurosurgery, way better than... There's hundreds of those oaks. Uh, you can join us, you know? Anyways, so um, uh, one of the other things the charity has done is started to contribute towards the training of pediatric surgical registrars. Um, it's contributing quite significantly towards research in pediatric surgery. And then the fourth pillar is to create awareness and advocacy around pediatric surgery in South Africa. So I'm just going to quickly show you a few of the things so that you get an idea of um, how much things have changed. None of you will actually remember Old Barra because none of you were uh, students at the time. So I became a medical student in 2006. Uh, I was lucky I joined the GEMP program. And at that time, Barrett started to change quite substantially. Um, uh, it didn't change for pediatric surgery, so I'll show you there. That was our old outpatients department. Uh, that was the outpatients department and the stoma clinic. So there's two rooms in that building with one tap, one examination room with two plinths. How many patients a year do you think we saw in that, in that room there? 12,000. So we see about 12,000 outpatients per year, right? So one of the first things that the charity did was to replace that with this which is unbelievable. So this is our new facility, and it was opened in 2017. And it's not just a new outpatients facility. So if you come and bring your child to me here, it will be like coming to see me or any of the other consultants in a, in a private hospital. Um, but not only did we make a new outpatients facility, we also made a new admissions ward. So when you come to the hospital, Barra doesn't have a dedicated pediatric casualty. I mean, the patients get split into... Uh, surgical patients and medical patients, and they sort of find their way to the surgical pits. I'm sure all of you have seen that. You all know that it's not very child-friendly. But as soon as they're done there, they come to this much better environment, which is very child-friendly, very modern. Uh, it's a much better place for them to go to. So in addition to the new OPD, we also have the new admissions ward. And at the back of the ward, we were able to create a playground. 
All of you will think that these are relatively minor things, but actually in the rehabilitation of children, these things are so important. I mean, sometimes we go a bit crazy in the playground, but really these are little, 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 little things that we've done to help improve the quality of care that our patients receive. So I'm not sure if you guys are all aware, but most of the children that come to a public facility in South Africa, or in, certainly in Johannesburg, are indigents. They, they, they don't pay for the service that they receive. Um, I'll tell you, it's not often the case that you will find a child that comes, that is even just uh, not malnourished, yeah? Most of them are malnourished, most of them are extremely poor. Um, I don't know what their home circumstances are like because I've never been there, but I can tell you that they're not what you and I experience in our homes. So in addition to all of these um, sort of bigger infrastructure projects, the charities also implemented extremely simple things um, uh, from things as basic as giving uh, clothing to a child that gets admitted to the ward, giving them a toy, making sure that they have toothpaste and soap so that their parents can wash them while they're in the hospital. Because these are not things that are necessarily guaranteed when you, when you go to a public facility. So these are the kind of simple things that we've started to do. And from those simple things, we've grown our projects to a, to a really vast scale. So obviously, the outpatients department is the one that you all see when you come with the new admissions ward. We've also added on top of the outpatients a maternal sleepover facility or a parental sleepover facility. So if any of you have children and your child gets admitted to a private hospital, you'll have the privilege of sleeping with them. That never existed in a public hospital in Gauteng before. So now we have a larger facility for about, I think, 24 parents that can stay with their children. Obviously, the demand is a lot higher. Uh, we can only accommodate 24 at a time, but you know, we try our best. So, in terms of the charity, I'm not 100% sure if this is exactly what you wanted to hear about or you wanted to concentrate on clinical cases. The charity is now progressing to take on more projects. Um, so the next big project that we've embarked on is the, uh, a lactation unit and a breast milk bank. And that will be probably the first of its kind in Johannesburg and one of only a few in, 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 in Gauteng province, one of a few in South Africa. Um, we've secured the funding for it, and we're just struggling to get uh, zoning to be able to build that facility uh, at Barra. But within the next, uh, you know, 12 to 18 months, we should have that up. After that, our great grand plan at Barra as a charity is to build a new pediatric casualty. Um, it's in the region of about a half a billion rand. And all of that money will come from uh, fundraising that we do as a charity and partners that we, that we approach. Uh, so the actual building will be put up by the charity. Probably the first two years or the first three years will be run by the charity and then it will be taken over by the state. So you can see that uh, a small group of people that put in a relatively large amount of effort can achieve quite a substantial change when they put their minds to it. Is there anything else that you guys really want to know about the charity before we carry on? I didn't quite get it. Who's Mohammed Ravat? He, he, uh... Unfortunately, he couldn't make it due to uh, religious... Uh, oh, religious. sure. He's breaking fast. Yes. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So is there anything else that you guys really want to know about the charity? I didn't, I didn't quite know if you wanted to know more about the charity or you wanted to know more about clinical pediatric surgery. Uh, we wanted to give you more of an open... Uh, Open, uh, sure. Slate to sure. Do you guys have any questions about the charity? <clears throat> Is it only in Gauteng? So at the moment, it's only in Gauteng uh, because um, the primary impetus for it is by clinicians based at Paraguanath Hospital. Um, so for now, we are only based in Gauteng. That being said, uh, I'll take you through a few clinical cases. We accept patients from everywhere. Uh, so that's one way in which we extend our reach outside of Gauteng. Um, there's a few other interesting ways in which we've been able to, uh, able to create partnerships outside of the province. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this, but when you come to the hospital, you get a white file with a GT number. Your entire medical record is in that file. So if you lose it in a taxi or if you're, 
you know, you're in a shack fire or whatever, and that medical record is gone. There are not many departments in the hospital that are able to create electronic records. So since 2013, we've had a system of electronic record keeping, uh, which is quite novel in a public hospital in South Africa. And what we are trying to do now is because we get a lot of supernumerary registrars that come and train here and that are supported through Surgeons for Little Lives, at, at least in part, when they go back to their home countries, in addition to providing clinical support, because once you qualify as a surgeon, doesn't mean that you can go and do whatever you like. You still need a lot of support, backup from people that are more experienced. In addition to providing that kind of support, we also provide this support in terms of an electronic database so that wherever the patient ends up, there's a record of what was done, what was wrong, so that if the patient gets transferred here, we know if the patient then goes off to wherever and presents three years later, there's still, a, there's still a record. So that's one of the ways in which we're sort of extending our reach outside of Gauteng province, in addition, to, um, in addition to accepting patients from literally all over South Africa. Probably the only places that we don't get patients from are the Western Cape, because they have a relatively small population with a relatively well-developed pediatric surgical service. And um, that's it. Otherwise, we take from everywhere, including Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, Angola, Swaziland, Lesotho, and all the provinces in South Africa. Do you think you ever want to um, expand the project like right, to make public hospitals in other provinces? Absolutely, absolutely. So that's the goal. And I think that will be a, a part of the theme of this lecture. Um, you'll realize that um, uh, there's lots of different forces that have led to um, the decline of healthcare in South Africa, a loss of personnel, loss of motivation, all of those kinds of things. And it's really up to everyone that's listening to this lecture, it's up to me, it's up to you, it's up to everyone with an interest and the, the capacity to, uh, to, 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 to make things better than they are right now. Unfortunately, we're, um, we're working off uh, quite a low base, uh, yeah? But even in spite of working off of quite a low base, we're able to achieve a lot. Um, but yeah, eventually the, the aim will be to be everywhere. Or at least, at least make it so that even if we're not everywhere, any child has access to an excellent service. So one of the next projects that I'll get you know, one of the next projects that we're working on as, as the charity is to create a transfer service. So we find that a lot of the patients that we accept from Mafikeng, or they don't even have to come from Mafikeng. They can be coming from Natal Spread to Barra, which is what, all of 50 kilometers. It can take them 12, 16, 20 hours to get to us after accepting because of the lack of a, a ambulance service. So one of the things that we want to create for ourselves is a dedicated pediatric surgical or pediatric emergency transfer service, which will be uh, funded by the charity. And I just wanted to ask, you said when you eventually get to the pediatric casualty that it will be run by you guys for a bit and then be taken over by the state. Is this clinic also run by the state or is it still run by you? Um, no. So, uh, you know, you enter into like a memorandum of agreement with different partners. So we provided the funding, uh, we built the facility, and then for a period of time, we agreed to maintain the facility. Uh, but all of the staff that work, or, uh, more mostly all of the staff that work in the clinic, especially those that are providing a clinical service, are all employed by the state. We do employ a few people in the charity to do certain things. So we have play therapists that come, we have administrators, we have um, like house mothers that look after the parents and look after the children while they're in the hospital. Uh, but that's a very small component of the people that are actually working to getting getting these kids better. Any other questions about the charity before we go to the clinical stuff? No. You guys can ask questions at any time, okay? All right, so I call this the weird, the wacky, and the just plain what. So the idea is to show you a little bit about what pediatric surgeons do, but you mustn't get confused because all of you will be doctors in, I don't know, 18 months. Is it 18 months? Three. Yeah. <laughs> no. Six years. Oh. How many months is that? 72 months. All of you will be doctors eventually. There we go. 
And the important thing to remember is that, you know, 90% of the work that you'll do as a doctor is common stuff. You don't have to be the professor of anything to be able to do this well, yeah? You just have to have common sense, a little bit of compassion, and be willing to work hard. Uh, you know, the people that remember all those funny things in the textbook, you know, yeah. <laughs> Not so useful, yeah? The, the more useful people are the people that are willing to work hard, take a little bit of punishment so you can, you know, give your patient a good service. So just remember that 90% of the things that you do will be rudimentary, mundane things. But if you do them well, or if you do them excellently, fantastically, they will be so much better for your patient than if you do them poorly. Like get the right analgesia, get the right antibiotic, make sure fluids are being given appropriately, make sure that your patient knows what's going on, rather than going on the ward round and telling everyone, oh, you know the answer because you remember. Okay, so what I thought I'd start with is by showing you how much of work we actually do. So there's only five consultants at Para, but we managed to do 197 cases per month. So this is just a cutout of our of our of our M and M. Yeah, so this is from last month actually. So we do about 200 admissions per month and about 200 operations per month. Not all, not all uh, operations are attended by a consultant, but you can see that the, the, the workload is actually quite high. We have been quite fortunate because we have a unit that's growing. We're one of the only units in South Africa. We're certainly the biggest and the busiest pediatric surgical unit in South Africa, but we're also only one, one of the only few units that have been able to allow consultants to subspecialize. So when you go to general surgery or go to Barra, there'll be unit one, two, three, and four, and five, right? So one is trauma, and then the rest is upper GI, breast, uh, soft tissue, endocrine, and colorectal. So the reason that they can do that is because they have a, a quite a big staff complement, right? We've started to start doing that. So you can see that we have colorectal clinic, a urology clinic, burns clinic, and a HBB service. So. I mean, you guys won't uh, really appreciate this, but uh, on the screen there, when you think about the amount of work that we have to do and the amount of interesting cases that we see, each, each one of these cases is what you would call an index case. So it's a, it's a defining surgical case for your unit. And you can just see, I mean, we did four neonatal laparotomies for NEC. We did four closures of abdominal wall defects. We had an anorectal malformation. Um, you know, we did a Kasai Porto enterostomy for a patient with biliary atresia. We did a LADS procedure for malrotation. None of these things will mean too much to you right now if you haven't really been through the hospital and seen all of these things. But if you're a, if you're a surgeon, then this means a lot. Like people come from Italy, people come from Germany, people come from France because they'll take maybe two years to see this number of cases that we saw in one month. And this is just one, one slide, yeah? And you can see the variety. I mean, we're talking about neonatal cases. We're talking about a laparotomy for a gunshot IVC. We're talking about a laparotomy for a blast injury. The spectrum of cases is fantastic in, 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 in our environment. Not all of it is good, because lots of these problems come from social ills. But in order to learn, this is uh, unbelievable. So yeah, I just uh, I just put up uh, another slide showing you other things that we've done, uh, just to, just to give you an idea of you know uh, the the variety and the scale of cases that you'll be able to see if you do eventually come and join us at Baragona Hospital. Anyway, so now we'll go through a few clinical cases, and because I think Mohammed wanted you guys to be, I don't know, surprised. <laughs> This is a case that was born at Joburg Hospital, I think, a year and a half ago. So it's a pair of conjoined twins with what we call a gastroschisis. Um, unfortunately, they, they, they didn't survive. Anybody can guess what this is? What year of medical school are you in? Third year. Third year. Yeah. What's this? <laughs> <laughs> So this is also like a spectrum of congenital abdominal wall defects. It's called a pentalogy of Cantrell. This is called a scrotoschisis. So this baby was actually born with a gonad outside of the scrotum. 
So again, just to show you the scale of things that we do, we do everything from neonates to trauma, right? So this little boy here had a dog bite of his femoral artery that we repaired. And this little girl here, unfortunately, was a bystander in a shooting, and uh, that's the bullet sitting on top of her IVC. As soon as I took it out, it started bleeding, but she's fine, don't worry. So this is, again, some interesting cases that we've had in the recent past. This is called a bladder extrophy, and this is called a cloaca. So this is a type of anorectal malformation, and this is when you're basically born with your bladder outside of your abdomen. And then I was telling you about the charity and how we take patients from everywhere and we try and help as many people as possible. So this is one of, uh, or this is two children that actually came to us from quite far away after looking for help in, in many different places. So this little girl comes from Lesotho, and that's her dad. She had a tumor of a kidney, which was deemed irresectable in another facility. I, will, I won't tell you where. And she ended up with us, and we took it out, and she's okay. This is another little kid. She doesn't live far from the hospital, actually, but she was also, you know, treated, mistreated, misdiagnosed for uh, probably two and a half years. She had what we call a cholidocal cyst. Eventually, she ended up with us, and now she's completely fine. Her mom, this was two years ago, her mom still sends me messages every three or four months telling me, thank you so much. Every time she comes to the clinic, she gives me a hug. I'm supposed to give them chocolates. Sometimes she brings me a sweet. This is really nice. This is a little girl in this picture that had what we call a duodenal stenosis. So she lives in the northwest province, and she lives on a farm. She got admitted to a hospital in the northwest 17 times. So a duodenal stenosis is an upper GIT obstruction, right? It's not a complete obstruction. It's not an atresia. It's just a narrowing. And it will present at different times in your life, depending on how narrow or how much of the intestinal lumen is occluded. So she actually got admitted record 17 times with vomiting. She's nine years old. So when she came to us, she was 13 kilos. That's her there. So it was a relatively easy surgery. It wasn't very complicated. And this is her after the surgery. She's crying and holding onto the wall and the cardiac trolley because it was her time to go home and she didn't want to go home. <laughs> I can't show you her face, uh, but, you know, I mean, when she came, imagine a nine-year-old girl. She's about this high. Yeah? No meat. When you saw her afterwards, she's puffy cheeks, you know? It was amazing. It was really cool. So, like I said to you before, you know, this is one of our registrars, and it looks so cool when you're in neonatal theater operating on a baby that's one kilogram, and you've got your loops on, and, you know, you're the bee's knees. But actually, most of our work is, like, kind of gross, yeah? This is a little kid with an intersusception, and literally what we've done is taped his bum closed and put a pipe up and shoved air up the pipe in order to reduce the intersusception, yeah? So I think that you must use that as a lesson for your further careers in medicine as well. Uh, it is easy to try and be that glamorous doctor that, you know, you know what you see on TV, but 95% of your job is not that, yeah? 95% of your job is just remembering to be as decent as possible to people that really need your help. And try your best in spite of the fact that you are going to be absolutely exhausted which is the reality of medical life in South Africa. Oh, it stopped going. I don't know why. There we go. Ooh. There we go. So this is a picture I took when I was still a registrar. And this doctor was my junior. She was actually my medical officer. Now she's a registrar in pediatric surgery in uh, Medunsa. And this was us at 2 in the morning. I found her plonked over. So this is actually the reality of life as a surgeon. This is what you're going to be spending most of your time doing in between trying to help other people. Uh, but it's a really cool life, and I would really encourage all of you to come and spend as much time as you like with us in the unit so we can show you what we do and how important it is just to be able to do these very, very, very simple things well. Because... Everybody here needs it. So I told you that there's going to be a prize for you guys. 
this man is very famous. He wrote this textbook, or he was the editor of this textbook. His name is Lewis Spitz. So I've showed you a picture there, and I've given you my phone number. There's a picture of Lewis Spitz on this floor somewhere. The first person that takes a picture of that picture and sends it to me gets a Surgeons for Little Lives t-shirt from me. Do you guys know who Lewis Spitz is? No, never heard of him. Anyways, he's very famous in pediatric surgery and he actually graduated as a surgeon from this university. Um, he was the head of pediatric surgery at Barra and then he went to England. So, if you guys can find it, you can get that t-shirt. So like I was saying, we're a small team, but we're a pretty cool team. We like to do cool stuff. We like to have you guys around. We like to show you what we do. We like to promote interest in surgery, even if you find that you don't want to do surgery at the end of the day. Uh, we'll be very happy to show you what we do, take you with us into theater if that's your interest. And all you have to do is come and talk to us. Also, I don't know if you guys know this, but we have an extremely rich history of medical excellence in Johannesburg and at this university. And Lewis Spitz is just one example. Um, who knows a little bit about orthopedics? Anybody? Has anyone read an orthopedic textbook called Solomon and Apley? No? Have you? Have you heard of it? Yeah, so we're doing legs, so I'm fourth year now. So we're there you go. So you know about Solomon, right? Yeah. Right? Where did Solomon come from? I'm not sure where he came from. Baraguana. Yeah, so imagine the textbooks that you're using, that everyone in the world is using, and this is just two examples, orthopedics and pediatric surgery. Everybody in the world is using this, are from our university and from our city. So you must be really proud of where you come from. Don't, uh, don't, uh, don't think that this is, a, you know, this is the best place in the world to study medicine. I, I can tell you that. Baraguana Hospital or the Joburg Circuit, Wits University is one of the best places in the world to study medicine. I'm not sure if you guys know, uh, what's that tablet? Ivermectin that everyone was uh, promoting when COVID first came out. So there's a guy called Paul Merrick, and he's the one that's promoting Ivermectin. He's really famous. He's an ICU doctor. And he went on TV and he said, I went to the best university in the world to study medicine, Wits University. <laughs> so... <laughs> We have, a, we have a really, really rich history of medical excellence from our university and from our city. And you guys must become part of that. You must you know, work as hard as you can, learn as much as you can. But most importantly, don't let it get to your head. Just remember to be as decent as you can because all of the patients that you now come across are going to be completely reliant on your willingness to be good, to work hard in spite of the fact that you have to sacrifice so much. Okay. So always remember that. If you guys want to know about the charity a little bit more and I haven't explained enough, you guys can get more information on our website. You can follow us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. If you don't feel like you have time to become part of the charity but you're still interested in the charity, you can just follow us and then share our messages because the charity is growing now so that we're able to move away from capital projects like building new buildings and all of that to start doing other things like health promotion. So in the last two years, we've been going on the radio once a month to talk about uh, you know, different topics to spread health promotion, health prevention messages. We do the same thing on our, on our social media. And we need all of you to be involved to make the message spread as far as possible. So that will be a nice way for you guys to get involved. And then the last question for a prize. Does anyone know what this is? Even the online audience can answer. Nobody. You don't have any online messages yet. <laughs> no online messages. Nobody knows. You know. The last question that was when you introduced the lecture as to what was next. Is it why should you become a pediatric surgeon? No, no. That's, uh, this is the last question before you can ask me whatever questions you like. This is the last question for a prize. Anybody? Nobody? It's not Venus. It's Earth, man. Who said that? Earth. Did you say that? It's Earth. Well done. 
I don't know if I don't know if that qualifies you for a prize though. <laughs> That's like uh, I'm gonna give you. Add you in the raffle. We'll I'm gonna in the raffle. I'm gonna give you half. I'm gonna give you half of that. No, no, you can have a T-shirt. Don't worry. <laughs> it's Earth, and uh, the point of this picture is that this picture was taken by Voyager Two. So Voyager One and Voyager Two are the only interstellar spacecraft ever. So interstellar means that they've left our solar system. So. Every time I talk about the charity, I talk about it in terms of this, because Voyager was launched in 1970. This picture was taken from six billion kilometers, and that was in 1990, or six million, I don't know, six billion, six million, I'm not too sure. Anyways, it was far away. It took 20 years to get there, and it only left our solar system in 2012. Huh? So, that's the work that all of us have in this room. You guys are starting your careers now. I'm sort of, you know, maybe halfway through if I'm lucky, or maybe two thirds of the way through. And we come from a very, very rich tradition of medical excellence. We shouldn't let um, all of these bad things that we see in the hospital stop us from providing the best service that we can provide. And you must remember from now very early, as important as it is for all of you to learn the actual medicine, it's also important for you to learn to fight for your patients. Because if you stop fighting for your patient, who really cares how much medicine you know? Certainly, that's my opinion. Anyways, I gave away the answer, but Dominic, you can have a t-shirt. <laughs> the picture so, is called the pale blue dots, by the way. Yes, it's called the pale blue dots. Did you Google it? No, nope, I saw the TikTok. And oh, so you do. <laughs> and then that's right. TikTok tell, teaches you things. Wow. So, so you do win a prize. You, you, you win the first. Uh, you win the first. So don't, don't WhatsApp me about this because I get lots of calls every day. <laughs> so he's already won it, guys. Calm down. We're still doing the raffle. Yeah. <laughs> but the first person that can send me the picture of Lewis Spitz gets a T-shirt. So now I can answer whatever questions you want. inspired you to do pediatrics? Um, so, uh, can I give you the honest answer? So I was a game student. I studied arts, actually, uh, and then I did my master's. And then I was very lucky that I got into medical school. And um, in medical school, I knew that there was, I couldn't be a physician. Like, it's just not, it's just not for me. Uh, surgery, I think, as a discipline is a very nice speciality because you do a bit of anesthesia, you do a bit of surgery, you do a bit of uh, internal medicine. Like you have to be like quite a well-rounded doctor. You have to have interest in lots of different things. It's not how you maybe perceive it in the way that it's described to you by other doctors. It's not just about going to cut. It's not just about being a mechanic because it doesn't really matter how well you can fix tissue and all of that if you can't understand what is actually wrong with your patient and how to actually fix them, if, if that makes sense. So because of that, I was really drawn to a surgical discipline from, from the beginning. And then when I finished medical school, I was lucky. I did part of my internship at Barra. I worked at Clark Store, where I was exposed to um, surgery as a comserv. And then I did orthopedics. I worked for MSF. And then I came back and I did surgery again as a registrar. And it was at the time, and probably still is, like very competitive to get into pediatric surgery. Uh, so part of it was ego, and then a lot of it was also about the work that you do. Um, in pediatric surgery, you can get children that are uh, really fraught. I mean, they can be nearly at death's door. But if you do the whole package of things correctly, resuscitate them properly, identify what's wrong properly, like correctly, give them the right medication, and then give them the right surgery, they do very well, which is a little bit different in adults. Um, in adults, you know, if you're sick, then you're, there's a lot of things that are not reversible. Uh, so it's like very satisfying to, to be able to do that kind of work because um, you see a result from your effort. Uh, and, and that result can, last for, for a long time. I mean, I, I've been very lucky. I've had the privilege of operating on patients that my father delivered. So, you know, and, and still now, years after operating on a few patients, the mums will message you and say they're doing so well, send you pictures, things like that. So from a, from a, from a satisfaction point of view, it was really good. 
from an ego and technical skill point of view, it's amazing. Like you can't get, you can't get the amount of variety and technical, actual technical expertise that you need in any other branch of surgery because everything becomes very, um, very focused. In bead surgery, we're the last true general surgeons. I mean, we operate from the head to the toe. So, I mean, you saw on the, you saw on the on the slide there. I just just this morning, I did a scope where I banded varices. I did a laparoscopic uh, hernia repair for a for a diaphragmatic hernia, which I just left from now. Um, did a hernia, so you see, it's all all all, all parts of the body. It's fantastic. No. Any other questions, guys? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so surgery is probably one of the disciplines that take you a little bit longer to 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 specialize in. Um, so, um, pediatric surgery now is five years, but in order to qualify to do those five years, you first need to do 18 months uh, in which you need to get your primaries and your intermediates. And once you've got your primaries and your intermediates, then you then qualify to apply for a reg job in bead surgery. And then after that, it's five years. Before it wasn't like that. Uh, before it was, you had to become a general surgeon, which was five years or six years, five years, and then do a fellowship in pediatric surgery for two years. Then we got our own college, and um, it was two years of general surgery and four years of ped surgery. Now they've done away with that. So now you do the five years as a ped surgeon, but ideally you should do your intermediates and your primaries before you become a registrar. It's quite long. Radiology, three and a half. Medicine, two and a half. It's not the best lifestyle choice. <laughs> but it is the best lifestyle choice because our jobs are so awesome. Any other questions, guys? Yes. Uh, um, how would you compare your work in Canada and uh, South Africa? I didn't work as a doctor in Canada. I, I, I was a student. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so I can tell you in the last, in the last, so in the time that I was training, I think I've, I've had five different people come from overseas to work with us. Uh, and the last guy who's here, his name is Dr. Zanini. He has worked here for three years with no pay because of the experience that he gets here and because of the job satisfaction that he gets from working here. He'll be leaving on the 10th of May after three years, no pay. And it's not as if uh, the people that come are extremely wealthy. They're not, uh, they don't uh, come from what's it, trust funds or anything like that. They're just regular Joes like the rest of us. But because the experience is so good here, they take the sacrifice of, of that time to be able to develop their careers and become more competent at what they do. And that's, that's true for every speciality. Uh, I don't think that you can go to the hospitals that we work in, open a textbook and not find someone with that disease. Like, it's a cliche, but uh, like I generally don't think that. Genuinely don't think that. You guys must make use of your opportunity. I know it's pretty tough when you're sitting in the back of LT4 and it's hot and <laughs> like, uh, what's this oak talking about? The 52 Cs of diabetes. No, but uh, don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> You must take the opportunity to engage with your patients, engage with your consultants, engage with the registrars, and learn as much as you can, because you won't get this opportunity anywhere else. Um, why? So, I mean, is there much collaboration between the surgical pediatric unit at Barrow and other local and other provincial hospitals? Um, because it seems to be kind of a bit of a disconnect my understanding and my parents who work in the Western Cape's pediatric center that there's a lack of kind of communication. And Absolutely. And I just, I would, I would I'd be curious to like, why do, you, why do you think that is? I'm not 100% sure, yeah. but I, I know whose job it is to change that. Yeah. It's our job to change that. Yeah. And we, we all, um, so, you, you know, there's historical things. I mean, if you walk down that hall, I'm giving you a clue about where Lewis Spitz's picture is, you'll find a certain demographic of per people but we, we can't do anything about that. Uh, what we can do is build on the foundation that we've been given and make things better for our patients. Because it seems like there's some excellent specialists in different provinces, and I feel like... Absolutely. Of, 
Absolutely. I don't think, I can only speak about my department and I can only speak about why I chose to train there. I don't think that you can find that level of experience and skill in one place uh, anywhere else. And if you were to replicate it, you'd need 30 or 40 doctors um, instead of five or six. Um, and it is our job. It's all of our job. And you must remember this. I mean, like, uh, you know, in all likelihood, most of you won't end up in surgery. If we're very lucky, some of you will end up in pediatric surgery. But you must remember it in whatever you do. It's up to us to recreate or not recreate, but um, uh, build on the medical excellence that we have. Yeah. We have, a, we have an online question. Yeah. Uh, from Faith Yu, what was the doctor's most memorable case? Oh, there's no most memorable case. Uh, all of them are memorable. And actually, you'll realize that it's such a privilege to be able to, to do what we do. So even the most simple case can be memorable. Um, uh, they're, they're all, I mean, uh, you know, there's some that are more memorable because they're more technical and you feel better and you feel like a bigger hero. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, it's about doing your job well so that the patient and their family do well from what you've done. So they're all absolutely memorable. Answer E, all of the above. What's up? Uh, towards the beginning of the talk, you mentioned MSF. Yes. Uh, could you maybe tell us a bit about your experience with MSF? Yeah, it was awesome. It was fantastic. I would encourage all of you to do something like that. You don't have to go with MSF. You can go with whatever. But it was brilliant. So... I mean, you'll have a few advantages because you come from a place where you become a very good generalist. Um, when I went to work for MSF, a lot of the doctors were like very specific, like very, very specific. Um, so there was, a, there was a pediatric neurologist that only did seizures in the middle of the desert in Somaliland. And I was scratching my head and I was, okay. I mean, you know, I mean, it's nice for that person to be there, but... You know, that, those are not the problems uh, of the people that you're trying to help. So because of that, you'll be very, very um, competent and very sought after. So that's a nice thing. Uh, but you'll also get the opportunity to meet a lot of people and learn a lot from them, not necessarily doctors, because most of the people that work for MSF are not, are not medical. They're all engineers and accountants and all those kinds of things. But it's a great like life experience. Uh, you'll suffer a little bit, which is great. <laughs> which is not the worst thing in the world. And, and you'll learn a lot from it. So some of, some of my very good friends, I mean, uh, I worked for MSF in Somaliland. I made a friend. I was the best man at his wedding. Ten years later, we're still best friends. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's lots of fun. I'll give you an example. So uh, um, a little kid came in with a, a, a month-long history of diarrhea, and she was flaccid. I mean, she was flaccid, 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 couldn't even lift her head. And everybody was running around thinking she had polio. And I said, no, she doesn't have polio. She's got hypokalemia. She's got diarrhea. And I remember this because there was a prophet uh, <laughs> at Wits, actually. His name was Uday Kala. He's the, he was the head of nephrology a few years ago. Now he's retired. And he taught me about hypokalemia. And I said, no, this kid's got hypokalemia. But we didn't have any way of checking. We didn't have a blood gas. We didn't have a you know, a UNE machine, but we found this ancient ECG machine. I think it was from like probably in the 1970s and we saw U waves. So we slowly, slowly gave the kid potassium and a day later she's like standing up and you're like, what's going on? This is fantastic. So those kinds of experiences are, are brilliant, man. You, you, you'll take it with you for the rest of your life. Thank you. Yeah, sure, man. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges in pediatrics and pediatric surgery? And then to add on to that, do you have any regrets about going into pediatrics? No, absolutely not. Once you, you guys are so lucky. I think, I think I was 22 before I started studying medicine. It took me that long to realize what's the best job. This is, this is the ultimate best job in the world. I'm finished now. I've been finished for three years. I could easily stop working at Barra, go and work in private. You work half the amount of time that you would in public and much more money, have a much more stable life. But this is, you guys, you guys are so lucky. This is the most fantastic career that you could have ever chosen. So you must throw yourselves into it. Don't leave yourselves wondering, just go for it. And if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. You'll be fine. 
Uh, the challenges in pediatric surgery is a lack of staff. Really, the lack of staff. Uh, it's 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 really intense. It's very busy. Is that due to a lack of interest or lack of funding from the government? Probably both. both. Probably both. But I'd say the interest is now increasing. Yeah. Sudarshan. Um, just another question from the audience. Uh, they asked uh, if you, would you be open to taking on students for electives? Hundred percent. Absolutely. I want to see at least half of you rotating through the department in the next few months. We have a very open door policy. That's why I've given my phone number as well. You guys can take it. If you want to come, just pop me a little WhatsApp. Whenever it's convenient for you, I will put you in touch with the right person in our department. And uh, you can come and spend as much time with us as you like. Uh, another one from the, the YouTube audience. Uh, could you please repeat uh, how we can get involved with the charity and or get exposure in the field coming from a GEM1 student? Yeah, so if you want to become involved in the charity, you just have to decide how you want to become involved in the charity. If you want to raise awareness of the charity, there's a few things you can do. You can follow us on social media and just repost our messages. You can tell all our friends about it. You can buy the t-shirt and walk around the hospital or you know, whatever you like to raise awareness. Um, if you want to donate some of your time, you can come to the department and we'll tell you what project you can be involved in. Um, there's lots of little things that are going on all the time where we need manpower. And then if you want to uh, become in any, uh, involved in any other way, you can just come and spend time with us in the hospital and see what is the way that you can contribute given your own circumstances. Yes, ma'am. This is just a bit of a personal question, but how do you cope with the emotional waiting that comes with being in peds? Yeah, because it's very difficult. The highs are very high, but yes. the lows are also very low. Yes, it's very difficult. And it's, and it's something that you guys are going to experience from now until you finish, yeah? Regardless of which discipline of medicine you choose. Uh, and the thing that you must realize is that you can't really change too much about um, what resources you have. You can advocate for more like we do, but in the moment you can't do anything about that. All you can do is remember that you must be as decent as possible and work as hard as possible to make sure your patient gets the best. And it's very difficult. It really is very difficult. You'll be tired. You'll be frustrated. You'll be demoralized. But just remember, when you are like that, that patient is completely dependent on you. When a patient comes to see you at Barragonath Hospital in the clinic, that patient has got up at 4 in the morning, has got into a taxi when it's cold, has come to sit outside the clinic at half past 6, and you only see the patient at 11 o'clock. You don't have to be, yeah, 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 come, 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 go. Hello, how are you? Everything is fine. Take time, treat them with respect, talk to them nicely. Do your utmost to try and solve the problem at the time. Don't fob them off. Don't make it somebody else's problem. Take the responsibility on yourself. And if you do that, it's going to be very difficult. If you try and consistently do that, then when you go through your lows, you'll remember that you've done the best that you can. And I mean, you know, if you've done that, nobody can really expect more of you. Yeah. Because we do live in a very harsh environment. It's a very difficult working environment. But that doesn't mean we can't make it better, like we're doing right now. And don't give up hope. You must always have hope. Yeah, you, you will make mistakes. You will make lots of mistakes. Don't, don't not learn from them, because that's bad. But, uh, you know, always be diligent. Work hard. Keep trying to get better. Is government making your life easier as a charity where they're kind of adopted since it's happened? Uh, no, so we have a, I mean, we have a quite a reasonable working relationship with the hospital management. Uh, so there are times when we struggle and uh, there are times when we don't struggle. So I'd say it's reasonable. Yeah. Nothing is ever, there's no such thing as uh, because you say you want it and because the intention is good that everybody's going to accept it. It doesn't work like that. So you'll have a goal and you'll have a plan. And in order to get there, you're not going to do this. You're going to do this. Go that way, go that way, go that way, go that way, go that way. And then you'll end up there. And that's, that's how it is going to be with people in state and people outside of state. Just remember what your goal is and make sure that it's 
pure and justified, then you're fine. Well. So Dominic won the one prize. Are you guys all going to run around? I don't see any WhatsApps. No WhatsApp so far. So I think we... Oh, wait. Ah, uh, no, who's this guy? He sent me a picture of the picture I put up. <laughs> no, man. Was it specific? We are the... No, boss. <laughs> it's somewhere here, man. Hey, no, no, no. What's your name? <laughs> John T. John T. Disqualified. It's on this night. No, <laughs> this, is a, this is a picture taken like 30 years after that other picture was taken. I age well. Hey? Yeah, it looks the same. Yes, it's using gray hair. Hey? <laughs> Jonty. No, Jonty. Disqualified. Okay. Still no WhatsApp, so I'll give you guys a clue. It's not far from here. You're within like 30 meters of it. So, so the first person to send it to me. There's one or two finishing things. Yes. That we'll do. And then. Um, We'll let you guys. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But I think the don't be shy of asking me questions. Um, I have to confess, I was super busy in the last two weeks, like super busy. So maybe I didn't give you the the best talk. But if you ask me questions, you'll be able to get more information out of me. I think it was an amazing talk. Um, I'd love to, on behalf of the team. Thanks, guys. Thank you, you as well. That's very really nice of you. Um, I don't know if anybody hears that, but it's fine. We, we thank the doctor. For coming here. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, thanks, Thank man. you so much. Thanks. But don't, um, don't don't be shy to ask questions. Ask whatever questions you like. What is the most common um, feature that you use? Inguinal hernia. So, I mean, this is the thing about this is the thing about what I was saying. Even the most common thing can become the most complicated thing. So, an inguinal hernia in a one-year-old is very different from an inguinal hernia in a 900-gram patient. Uh, you can't see anything in a 900 gram patient tumor. Where your loops, the tissues are very friable. If you don't do it well, there's every chance that you will mess the patient up. Um, so even though it's a relatively simple thing, just like everything else you do, you must pay attention and you must do it excellently the first time. But yeah, in pediatric surgery, inguinal hernia is the most common thing we do. Um, the impact of infectious diseases on pediatric surgery is it quite. Yes, absolutely, 100%. So we are lucky. I'm not sure. Do you guys know who Prof. Harun Saluji is? You guys do know who Prof. Saluji is. You must go on YouTube. So he's one of the doctors that sued the government with the treatment action campaign to make sure that antiretrovirals were available to HIV-exposed children and mothers or HIV positive mothers in the public sector. So it was because of him and Triton Action Campaign and a whole bunch of other people that we have this ARV rollout program the way that we have it now. And I was a medical student after he had done that. So obviously in our country, HIV and TB are the most common things that you'd be, that you'd be thinking about. And since day one, and since we have a proper PMTCT program, we see less of these types of things, you know, uh, where infectious diseases have a major impact on your child. Um, there are other things where the infectious disease is the cause of the surgical problem. You know, you, you do get those types of things where you get CMV of the intestine with multiple perforations and things like that. But uh, in general, we don't find what they used to find pre the rollout of this program where you get really stage four children and then it doesn't matter what's wrong with them yeah they could have a simple inguinal hernia but they're going to do far worse than uh, than a child that's you know on ARVs or whatever but infectious diseases still do have uh, quite a quite an important part to play in our in our in our profession simply because not everybody gets the medication that they need to in the time of COVID, a lot of people have defaulted treatment, and then you'll get lots of infectious disease that have surgical complications that you have to deal with. And also, imagine when your department is five consultants and six registrars or seven registrars spread over three hospitals and five people get COVID. <laughs> the patients don't run away. You just have to stay and work harder. Yeah, that happens a lot. Sure. The, the, the machine has stopped working. I can go back. Oh, we'll, 
get that done. Oh. <laughs> so there's not much to say, really. There's not much to say, really, except that, um, you know, uh, we do see uh, quite a few conjoined twins. I actually saw a pair of conjoined twins last week. Um, uh, they were born at Para. Um, uh, but the interesting thing about this set of conjoined twins was that they were born with gastroschisis, yeah? So gastroschisis is when your bowel is exposed to the atmosphere, there's no abdominal wall covering. So it made it like quite complicated. Um, uh, so the problem that we have there is that your bowel is exposed to the atmosphere. So as soon as you, you're born, it's an emergency. And the principle of management is to return the intestine to the abdomen. Uh, achieve abdominal wall closure and prevent sepsis. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to do it for, for this, this, this set of twins. So what we did was what we called a stage reduction, which is acceptable. We put a bag over it to keep it as sterile as possible. It looks like a female condom. It's a spring-loaded bag. You pop it in, and then you try and achieve reduction over a period of days, because if you push everything in at the same time and you close it, your stitches will hold, but you may compromise the venous return you may aggravate the afterload so the patient won't perfuse as well. You'll give them something that we call abdominal compartment syndrome. So this was a very complicated case because not only were they seriously complicated conjoined twins because you can see that they're attached at the chest and the abdomen, so you're not sure what they're sharing in terms of liver, cardiac, lung, uh, but they also had a gastroschisis. So the conjoined twins from last week were only attached by a little piece of umbilicus that you could just, <laughs> you could even take a hairband. Yeah. Yes? How common are the twins? Uh, I can't give you an uh, incidence, I'm not sure. I can tell you that I've been in PED surgery since 2015 and I've seen about seven or eight in our hospitals. Yeah, so about one a year, maybe a bit more. But I don't know uh, in which population they're more common. Uh, I don't know what are the things that make them more common. Sorry. I have to ask a pediatrician. <laughs> are there any like, common misconceptions about pediatric surgery? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say so. I think that because the workload is so high and because the work is so intense because of the things that you mentioned, like you're dealing with the patient and the family and the patient is a child, it scares a lot of people away. And it shouldn't. Because it's your privilege to be able to work hard for these patients. Yeah, it's very satisfying. It's very, very satisfying, even when it doesn't go that well. Because you know that you're really making a difference. It shouldn't scare you to to be given so much responsibility. Um, of those seven or six or seven conjoined twins that you have seen, how many of them survived? Four. Four out of seven. Were they less conjoined? So it was an easier, easier to um, separate them? They haven't been separated. Oh, so they're living have you ever tried to separate the conjoined? I haven't, but they've done it. Uh, I mean, we've done it in our department. They've done it in Pretoria. We had Lewis, an announcement about that. Lewis Spitz was one of the men that did the first separation of conjoined twins of children at Great Ormond Street. The twins came from Nigeria. They were flown to Britain, and a South African separated them. <laughs> <laughs> One question from the uh, online audience again. Um, I'll just actually cut to the chase because it's quite a long lead up. Did you ever reach a point in your career where you thought uh, you might leave medicine? No. Uh, or how did you continue through the system? No, not at all. <coughs> not, not ever. This is a. Uh, I mean, I did an arts degree, guys. This is the <laughs> this is the coolest job in the world. You guys should all come. It's fantastic. And you will get tired. I mean, you must accept it. You will get tired. That's the nature of working in medicine in South Africa. It's going to be rough. Just accept it. But do your best. It's awesome. I, 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 if I could swear, I would. But <laughs> I'm not allowed to. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It is the best life that you could have ever chosen. I think you are better equipped to manage 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
through the ward-based outreach teams in order to try and prevent the problem from happening in the first place. Makes sense. So we need to create the same kind of uh, impetus for all these primary healthcare problems that we face. So at Vera, our next project that we have in mind is to go to the JMPD and ask them to enforce, um, uh, what do you call it, like speed restrictions around schools and in residential areas. Because I think about 16% of the patients that we treat are victims of MVAs and PVAs. So I mean, like, do you really need to be doing that? Like 1990, we had the same problem. 2022, we have the same problem. It's not as if we don't know how to fix it. We just have to have the willingness to do the things to fix it. And we mustn't think that because I'm a pediatric surgeon and I like doing very complicated surgery, that it's not my job to advocate for all of these other things. It is absolutely my job. Makes sense? Yes, but um, so some in my position that wants to study medicine, I think I want to study medicine, I want to work with patients. So uh, before, maybe before this lecture, I thought maybe that I shouldn't think about the aspects about logistics and stuff like that. But how are we going to incorporate this thing where medical students and medical personnel must think about how they can improve it, how they can create this awareness if they're only being taught to be a you're not only being taught to be a medical professional. And when you go into medical school, you'll take the perspective that you learned from whatever you're doing now. So when you go to medical school, you won't only be taught about medicine, you'll be taught about other things as well. The fact that you've studied something else before you became a doctor or the fact that you come from a particular place with a particular context means that you'll take that to the people that you learn from, the people that you learn with, and you'll share your ideas with them. Yeah. And I mean, there's a whole branch of medicine called public health as well, if that's where you want to go. Yeah. Not so much related to pediatrics, but I think it's a universal, well, not a universal, but countrywide. The public sector obviously is overburdened by the pure quantity of patients that it sees. What impact do you think um, the complete like introduction of NHR in a couple of years, what will that, what impact would that have when a lot of patients from the private sector then move into public with that further burden. Um... I don't think that's the idea behind the NHI. I think the idea is to take some of the burden away from the public sector to better resource private sector facilities, right? So I think it would work in the other direction. I don't know how controversial I can be, but I don't think that we have the administration to make that work right now. I don't think that our administration is competent enough and corruption-free enough. That's, that's the truth. Um, it's very difficult to get things done in the public sector because there's no quantifiable matrix for anything. Like, you cannot go to a someone with a system to tell you how much money was spent on drugs this month, yeah, in your department. Nobody will know. And until you create those kinds of structures, you can't really implement the idea of an NHI because you must be accountable in some way. I'm not sure that we have that level of accountability. It's certainly my experience is that we don't in the public sector. But that doesn't mean that we mustn't work to make it happen. So I think we still have a way to go. But that's my opinion, and it's a very ignorant opinion as well. You know, I can only speak from my perspective. Thank you. Yeah, so I know this is off topic. You don't have to say sorry. You can just ask. No, but it's <laughs> don't be sorry. Uh, but sort of, I know Simon has been feeling some resistance to the NHI because of those concerns. But why has it not been more sort of upfront, more sort of you know um, deliberate? Because I think those concerns are genuine. Um, I mean, if you have a look at the bill, I mean, it gives all the power to the Minister of Health, and I don't think we have to remind ourselves of sort of what that could lead to. So, what are like public sector doctors doing, Sama and us? Really I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm, I have no idea. Uh, but I can tell you that you can be doing something, and you can be the one to teach me what to do as well. Um, so the point is that it's all of our responsibility to hold these people to account, right? And I think maybe for a long time we've been like quite shy and quite quiet about, uh, about wanting to do that because we're worried about our own jobs. But at some point you have to make a stand, like, like you really do. I mean, so I'll give you guys an example. There's a tap 
outside Ward 6 at Barra. It's been leaking since June 2019. I don't know how many people I've complained to, phoned, harassed. They replaced the tap last month. <laughs> <laughs> now it's not leaking. <laughs> so that's my victory. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, seriously, like it's up to us. It really is up to us. Yeah. We can't say this patient is not important because this patient comes to the public sector and I have my private practice. Because all of the doctors in the private practice come from the public sector. They became clever in the public sector, then they went to the private sector. So it is all of our responsibility to make sure that the public sector works better. And you mustn't be shy to hold people to account. You mustn't. That's their job. They're supposed to do it properly. Just like you will be held to account if you do something incorrect. The requirements for primaries. Um, for primaries, it's BLS. And for intermediates, you need three months of surgery with trauma, and you need three months of ICU and the primaries. And you need to do the basic surgical skills course for primaries as well. So for primaries, it's BLS and the basic surgical skills course. And then for intermediates, it's the ICU. As far as I remember, it could have changed. You're thinking of writing? Start studying now. <laughs> Joking. I think for now, I think we'll do the draw. And then I think, because we also have the catering that is next door. And so I think if you'd like to stay around and maybe answer some of the questions, you know, walk-ins walk or whatever. But I think um, in case anyone does need to go and feels awkward um, stepping out at the moment, I think we will do the draw now. Um, if we can get the... <laughs> I don't mind staying later if you guys have questions. I don't, I don't mind at all. If you don't have questions, then I'll carry on. I hope you had fun. Most importantly, even if you don't come and visit me, I hope all of you remember to work hard and be as decent as you can be when it is your turn to see someone in casualty or see someone in clinic. Okay. I feel like I ignored this side of the room because the podium is here. <laughs> There was a yaw, so I feel like uh, <laughs> Caitlin, Caitlin Summers was in the, or Caitlin Fleming was in the room. Oh, so close. Again. <laughs> Just a tip, if you have to redo a surgery this many times. <laughs> Call a friend. Yes, you! <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, that's time behind here, I think. Okay, awesome. So um, we will take note while we have your information, and so we will put you in touch so we can see what we can organize for you. Um, otherwise, I don't know who can hear me online. I think I'll just go ahead up there just to end the stream. Hello. Um, so to all the people online, we are going to end the stream. Um, maybe if you came in person, you could get the catering too. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, I think we're going to end here. And um, yeah, goodbye, everyone on online land. And uh, I think we can end the, the stream there. Um, for everyone else, uh, thank you so much for, for coming. Um, so you can go.